We're very fortunate today to have um, Paul Blackmore with us today. He's here to speak with us about his very interesting field work that he's done around Mount Cameroon um, in Africa. So let's all welcome him. Thanks very much. Well, good morning. And uh, as you can tell, I've got an accent. If you don't understand me, don't be afraid to say, Oi, I don't understand what you're saying. All right? <laughs> right. And if you've got questions, there's no problem to ask them. First of all, has anyone been to Cameroon or Central Africa? Is anyone from there? No? You've... Oh, really? OK. So you recognize this, of course. Where in Nigeria? Where? The South East state. Okay, okay. I used to go to Calabar and explore oh. that area too. So uh, this is, um, we're talking about Mount Cameron. I'm going to take you 7,000 miles into a part of the world that's f not that often visited by people from our culture. Um, it's a fascinating part of the world. It's 7,000 miles away and you could argue that it's 700 years behind the times as far as medicine and plants um, and uh, development is some way can you know it's very old-fashioned and it's but it's shockingly up to date as well when you start looking at uses of plants and what what I'm going to tell you about I was there for eight years living in the village of a seaside town um, of Limbay and Limbay is on the Bay um, South Atlantic Bay it's uh, looking out to sea you see 60 miles away you see Fernando Po, the island, which looks exactly like Mount Fuji. Um, and in the garden, turning round, this is what we would see on a good day. This is the highest mountain in Central Africa. It's the Central West Africa. It's 4,449 meters. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's remains an active volcano. And the reason it's interesting is because the people who live on this mountain predominantly the Bequeri people, a tribe, are very much intact and they're also very much in tune with their ancestral use of the forest, the ownership of the forest and the medicinal plants and food plants that come from those forests. So they're a really intact, robust culture that still, although adopted many modern things, like you'll find huts in the forest and they've got parabolic reflectors with TV and solar discs and someone will be using a laptop um, but they're still using the medicinal plants and everything else like their ancestors just did such a so, so it's such a cool place to go and explore I lived there for eight years and my primary objective primary job was actually to take the old Limbe Botanic Garden and to renovate it into a center of research and conservation for this whole Mount Cameron region and the reason we were doing that um, and I went out in 96 and stayed to 2003. The reason we were doing that was as a part of a bilateral funded project between Germany, the UK, trilateral, and the government of Cameroon. And they wanted to bring back this botanic garden. It's a 52 hectare botanic garden. Um, and the tribe, the people of the tribe are elders and the local community were the people who said that they wanted this garden renovated, but they didn't want it as an ex a garden full of exotic plants. They wanted it a garden full of useful native plants from small herbs, dye plants, medicinal plants, timber trees. They also wanted it to be used as a, a hub of conservation for this whole region. So I spent eight years working there helping with that. So where is Cameroon? Well, Cameroon's about the size of California. It's got about 21 million people. It is insanely culturally rich. There are dozens and dozens of little tribes all living together in this forested area. And up until 1890s or 1860s, when the Germans uh, actually started to open up this part of Africa, the tribes were pretty much isolated. And so they have 282 linguistic groups. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Not only do they uh, um, have 282 group, uh, cultural uh, languages, they also speak fluent French because they were one, after the Germans left, they were occupied by the French. Fluent English because the English had half the country as well. England had this piece. Everything else was French. They speak Pidgin English, and then they speak a strange, bizarre mixture of mum's language, dad's language, and Pidgin English all mixed up. So it's a very, very mind-blowing place. Um, and uh, so it's incredibly rich in people. It's 
known, unfortunately, it's termed the armpit of Africa, not because it's, it is hot and smelly, that is agreed, yeah? But it's not because of that, it's because it's in this wedge of land, you see, you see. And it's extremely mountainous all the way up. The border between Nigeria, there's a big river here, but the border between Nigeria and Cameroon is very much a mountainous border. And if you can see this, there are uh, thick, two thirds of the country, well, one third of the country is dense rainforest, actually coming up through here, Saniga River. But these are high altitude grasslands, they're like Scotland. And the people who live in here, are very tall, very dark, very handsome guys, people all dressed in these fantastically hand-woven colours. Those guys are really good with plants. The people down here are forest dwellers, yeah? Even right down to here where you've got the Bantu people, what, you know, used to be called pygmies, you know, these little guys, yeah? And, and um, so all of these cultures, they're all around and they all use the landscape. So there we are, that's where it is. So here's a, here's a satellite photograph. Yeah, obviously. And we actually lived in the town of Limbe, which was down here. And as you could see, it's almost totally forest. It's almost totally intact. You've got these banana plantations, tea, some coffee. It was the second wettest place in the world. Yeah. It was established, as I say, the town of Limbe was established by an English missionary. But it soon, it soon got taken over by a German colonial government. And they set up the botanic garden, which is actually down here, you can't see, it's off the picture. And they set that garden up to, for the pure and one only use, to introduce plants of economic use, yeah, to pay for the running of the colony, coffee, tea, cocoa. <laughs> so throughout this mountain there are patches of these crops, which are still the mainstay of Cameroon's economy to this very day, that timber and some oil. Um, I said that Mount Cameroon is an active volcano, and it is, and you see these lava flows. When I was there in year 2000, boom, the mountain blew off. We stood in the garden drinking gin and tonics, watching the volcano roar, and then this massive lava flow came down. Were you there then? It, uh, lady from Nigeria, were you there then? No? And this, this lava flow came down and it cut the only road between Cameroon, the big cities in Cameroon and Nigeria, which is over here. So. Um, um, the lava, we went and watched it. It was a kilometre wide. It came down, it ate everything in its path, it poured into the sea, everyone rushed in to collect the fish. It was just amazing. So, um, but it is a very active volcano. So the whole landscape has been shaped by this volcanic activity over millions of years. And that has put constant pressure on plants, people and animals. And so there's a massive diversity there. It's also believed to be a biological refugio site. Africa, Africa's a continent that gets wet and dry, wet and dry, wet and dry constantly. The forest retreats, the forest advances. It always comes back to this area in this region. So it's extremely um, ecologically rich and very species active. It's it, constantly new species being found all the time. The other thing to point out is this thick rain, this thick cloud layer. It never goes away. You know, never. You never see it. That picture I showed you earlier. It's really unusual that this went away for just a couple of hours and we took that photo. But this is where your cloud forest is. This is where your Prunus africana lives. We'll look at that. Okay, so as I tried to say, why is Cameroon so interesting? Why did the British government, of all the places in West Africa, why did we decide to put all our funds or a big chunk of our funds into Mount Cameroon? And the reason is, is because it's the hub of, of fully intact, very diverse biodiversity. And it goes without saying, you know, the, um, the extreme geograph geography and the volcanic activity constantly renews and recreates this landscape. Um, rich biodiversity, uh, there's like seven different ecosystems from mangrove swamps up to alpine grasslands. The region um, has a rich culture and the, and the cultural people there with the indigenous knowledge on how to use the forest very much intact and then of course there was a ready existing uh, not to say in less than a good state it was in a pretty shabby state when we got there but there was an institution that the government there was prepared to fund so it was the perfect place okay so these are more pictures um, just just trying to emphasize how thick and intact the rainforest is there. This is not Mount Cameron, this is small Mount Cameron. This is not the biggest mountain in Central Africa, but it's certainly the oldest. It's so old, it's made from a particular kind of rock called Etindanite, because the whole mountain is Mount Etinde. 
Um, we've got mangrove swamps, we've got um, islands, coastal islands, so many different ecosystems. And as I say, Fernando Po, as we talked about, imagine this. This is what it's like to work on this mountain. You, you go through the forest and it is a two-day hike to the summit, to the cone, yeah? And it's a two-day hike because everything, you're literally, literally walking like this. I've never seen anything like No one comes down with toenails, yeah? You go up, two days, and you might make it down in the day, and everyone's like, wow, those toenails, where did they go? Because, you, you, seriously, I'm not kidding you. It doesn't matter what you wear on your feet, it's a scramble. The last day is a solid scramble up this alpine grassland, full of endemics, very, very rich. Let's move on. Okay, the, um, talked about the Bequeri people. Um, they're very a proud, proud nation. When Germans landed there, they said, you know what? We don't want to live on the beach, you know. Every day someone dies of malaria. There's nothing to eat but fish, yeah? We want to go up the mountain, which is 4,000 meters. If we can go to the mountain, we can grow German food. We can grow potatoes, we can grow apples, we can make wine, we can cattle. Unfortunately for the Germans, these guys didn't share the same idea. And these guys actually, these warriors, stopped the German advance four times. It took them 30 years before they subdued this tribe so they could finally move up the mountain. And as I say, they're very active. Today, this time of the year, I think, I might be wrong, they do ceremonies all year round. This is the elephant um, dance. Um, it's a very cool thing. You go along, you're told to stay away, because if it runs you over, it will run you over. And it's, it's quite an amazing thing to see these really heavy costumes and these guys doing their uh, traditional dances and still using the plants the way they always used them. So they're still active, and we wanted to tap into their knowledge and they were actually guiding how the garden was going to develop. Um, just to pull a clearer map, um, this is Mount Cameroon. This is uh, the town of Limbay, and on the beach there is the 52 hectares of Botanic Garden. And our project area, these are banana plantations for Del Monte, but our project area literally covered the entire, within this, what is commonly called the ring road, although it's not a ring road. Um, this entire area. This area over here is a massive rain shadow and the plants there, it's an ancient lake and the plant, many of the plants there are totally new to science. We were exploring um, this whole area and what the garden was basically doing, working with the tribes and local community, this is the old um, Bequeri capital, Boya, which is the Germans finally conquered and made it into a provincial capital. You drive up this road and suddenly out of the mist is a giant German Walt Disney style castle, a slosh, yeah? It's the most bizarre thing. You're in Central Africa and everyone around you is Central African doing Central African things and you drive around the corner and sticking out the clouds is the most bizarre castle and it was their provincial headquarters. They're like, you're never going to forget us. So they built this massive great castle there. <laughs> and. Uh, um, but, as I was saying, we, we were basically, as a garden, one of our tasks was to work and to systematically grid this entire mountain and to collect as much as possible, put it in the herbarium. When we started, we had 47 specimens in the old German herbarium. When we le left, we had 38,000 and still many more. So that's what's still going on today. The teams are going out and they're with funds from various sources and they're mapping this entire mountain for biodiversity. It's very, very interesting. Okay, so we're talking about medicinal plants, right? So the thing about medicinal plants in Cameroon is it's not just, I've got a headache, I'll take an aspirin, yeah? It, the communities I talk to, uh, it's about if you've got a problem, it's because you're out of balance in some way. So it's a three-point system, it seems, in Cameroon. You have herbalism. Many of these things, all of these things come from the forest, yeah? Forest products. The diversity of products that come out of the rainforest is incredible, absolutely amazing. You could go to the market, and this is at the market, and you'll see hundreds of different things, all used for hundreds of different uses. But the, this is the herbalist side of it. 
But then there's a spiritual side, and that's where the costumes and the jujus and the masks all come in. And I had a friend who worked for me. He had, he had a problem, he had a kidney problem. He would go to his, his traditional doctor, and he would talk about his spirituality, his balance with nature, before he ever prescribed these. But their medicine is a combination of herbs, spiritual, and, and real belief. You know, it's a very complex system. Many of these things are also foods. They're spices as well. It's, it's like us. Nutmeg, in small amount, is a spice. In large amount, is a medicine. In great amount, is a poison. And it's exactly the same with a lot of these. When um, you talk to people in Cameroon, what do you get from the forest? What you would be surprised, there is no Kroger's, there is no Ingalls, there is no Publix here. Yeah? There's no CVS, but what, but what you'd be really surprised at is when you go into a village or even into a major town with 80,000 people like Limbo, you'll find that this is what's coming out of the forest. Where'd you get your fuel wood? You go and buy it at the farmer's market? No, no, we go and cut it from the forest. Well, where'd you get your mushrooms? Do you go to the farmer's market? No, 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 we pick it from the forest, yeah? 84% of their medicine is from the forest. Uh, 70% of the fruits are nuts from the forest. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. I mean, it's just incredible. You know, some of these things we shun at, you know, bushmeat, you're all disgusting. Yeah, you're right, you know, it's really bad to eat a gorilla. But they're not talking about gorillas, they're talking about snails and slugs and, and different kinds of organisms that are used in different kinds of medicines or foods. Fish, everything, insects, all over. So it's incredible that these societies, although they live in a developing country, they still very, very, very much depend on the forest for lots and lots of things. <coughs> That's a realisation that the world suddenly come to. You know, if we log all those forests, what are these people going to do? They're, these 80,000 people, they're not going to have the money to go to CVS. And if they did, they wouldn't trust the medicine they were buying in any case. Last resort. For them. Some of the spices, so we talked about, we're going to talk about a few of these. A few of these are really cool things here. Yeah. We would I'd like to stay all day and talk about all of them, but we can't. But there's a few things here that we will go through. This is, you recognise this, this is black pepper. Oh, I got it badly named, but this is black pepper. Some of these are spices that you might eat in medicines and things. Most of them you won't be familiar with. Some more fruits and spices, cola. You're familiar with Coca-Cola. Well, there's your cola nut, yeah? That's what goes into Coca-Cola. And that's the cola nut when it's been dried and prepared. First thing I want to tell you about is vegetable. Um, this vegetable is a strange plant, actually. I show, did, did you all come to the Botanic Garden? Or did you all go to the Botanic Garden? Yeah? Okay, did you point out the Needtums? Did you point out the Needtums? No. no? Okay, so this plant here, uh, this is a Needtum. Um, vegetables, again, you know, in Cameroon, the only thing you really grow is corn and starch, yeah? Um, and some vegetables and spices, but a lot of the stuff you're, you're eating is coming out of the forest. And this, particularly in Nigeria, <coughs> Afang, that's Afang. In Nigeria, this vine grows through the forest. Uh, and Cameroon, Central Africa all over. It's kind of extinct in some areas because it's been over harvested. This plant, you pick this leaf, this leaf here, um, and you slice it um, and you make this kind of a soup out of it and you eat it with fish and fufu. It's extremely nutritious, yeah? It used to be the preserve of the Bangi people, but the um, culture caught on and, and it it's now widespread consumption all over, all over Nigeria, all over Cameroon, down in Gabon. People love this stuff. And I tell you, it doesn't look too good, but it is seriously delicious. And the good thing about it is, in times of hardship, going back 100 years, when there wasn't enough protein to feed the kids, they couldn't get fish or bush meat, they'd feed the kids on this, but it has to be prepared just right, or it's totally useless. It goes straight through. You might as well eat a wire, a wire sponge, yeah? Um, but when it's prepared correctly, and cooking in Cameroon is very much a chemistry, um, it, it's extremely nutritious. Um, it's also a really important part of the economy. Thousands of tons of it are harvested every year. You, you pay people to collect it, you pay people to transport it. Ladies sit on the roadside sorting it and bundling it, people wash it. They take it to the market get where it gets resorted and decanted down the smaller 
um, portions, it gets washed again, and then it gets sliced, this lady slicing it with a razor sharp knife, she'll stand all day like this, it looks like green tobacco, like this. Uh, you sell it to the consumer and then you cook it, or you eat it at the cafe or the restaurant. Whole network of income generated for all different segments of the community. Um, but again, you know, super nutritious. One of the problems, of course, is over harvesting. Would you say that was overdoing it? You could take a beer, yeah, a beer, that is not a beer, a beer, and you could sit on a chair on the Limbe High Street outside the Botanic Garden. You see 50 of these a day going to Nigeria. Yeah, 50 a day, no problem, yeah? All illegal, because none of these guys have got permits. And they've come 360 miles from Yaoundé, the, the, the provincial capital where the forest is still loaded with this stuff. And they'll drive all the way to Nigeria. And you'll be able to buy this now in the African food stores around Atlanta. You can buy this dried out and sold, yeah? Interesting thing, the garden was like, this is unsustainable. We watched the prices in the market go up while the availability of the product went down. The garden set about, um, sorry. One of the key things we did at the garden was to set up a cultural program. We, we started collect, wild collecting material. We had it tested by locals for the quality. We developed a propagation project that didn't require any high tech, no chemicals, nothing. Yeah. We then put together a farmers union and we brought them to the botanic garden from all the villages. We trained them how to grow them, working with the women and the kids. The guys didn't want to know. Oh, you can't grow that. It doesn't taste right if you do. You know, it's magic. But the women call on, the kids call on. That program is now running in five Central African countries. And that's what gardens, botanic gardens in these regions really should be doing, you know. They should be working with the local community to preserve and develop the local resources. Another thing that um, is a very, very, very valuable uh, product, predominantly goes to Nigeria too, is bush mango, vingia. You know this? Yeah, for the soup? Or Achi. Achi. That's what I know it as, yeah. It's a fruit. It comes from this giant timber tree. It looks like a mango. It smells and tastes like a mango, but it's extremely stringy. But people are not after the fruit, although there is now a winemaking industry on the juice of this. It's very good. But they're after the seeds inside, and it's really hard to get these seeds out. So they collect the fruits, yeah. Then they stick them all over the outside of the house. This is in the jar forest <coughs> in Cameroon. They stick them on the outside of the house because there's no way of, of, break, of, of separating the stringy fibers from the seeds, yeah? So these people, they, they all collect fruit at the same time and of course the market dynamics start to kick in. So then they stick them on the house, yeah? And they decompose and the seeds come out and they collect up the seeds, sorry. They collect up the seeds and they basically process them. I think they boil them and crack them open and get the seeds out. They dry the endosperms um, and then they uh, take them to the market and sell them. They make this uh, obongo soup, bono soup in Nigeria and southern Cameroon they make a different kind of soup. It's what the seeds look like, this is what the fruit look like. But in our society this is becoming a major um, supplement for losing weight. It, it forces your body to burn tons of energy and apparently it's got a lot of promise and it's being developed at the moment, it's just in the health food stores, but it is being looked at for real clinical medicine. Prunus africana, Pigeum. As I say, you know, are you familiar with the genus Prunus? Anybody? Can anyone tell me what Prunus is? Can you, sorry, can you say? Oops. Prunus is uh, cherry, okay? And we got lots of them here in Georgia, yeah? Um, have you ever seen a cherry that gets that big? I mean, that's enormous, yeah? So, Prince Africana only occurs uh, over Africa, but it only occurs, it occurs all over Africa, but it only occurs in Madagascar, but it only occurs 800 meters and above. It, it occurs in the cloud forest. So, to find it is a difficult task, yeah? You walk, you walk, you walk, you walk up mountain like this as you saw the slope. You get into the rainforest, you might walk for three or four hours from your village before you find this thing. Then the objective is to strip off some of the bark, not all of the bark, but some of the bark, and um, basically you want to get it back to the factory 
or the collecting point, because there is a factory called Planticam on the side of the mountain, collects all this up, buys it off you by the kilo, and puts it in a big machine and turns it into brown duster. Now the interesting thing is, why is it interesting? Well, in Cameroon, this is 101 use this year, you could clean your windows with it, you do all sorts of stuff with it, yeah? and if you've got malaria or a real severe fever, you can make it into a tea or you can make it into a, a you could soak it in alcohol, make it into a liquor, drink it, and it really reduces <coughs> fever. It's really good for fever, urine infections, all sorts of stuff. <coughs> but in the 50s and 60s, the French chemical company, as I say, Planticam, discovered that, no, 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 it's good for that stuff, but it's really, really good for this, yeah? And you know what this is? None of you guys will be suffering from this yet. It generally only affects men, of course, because they're the only ones with the right gland, yeah? Um, and of course, if any of you girls marry those guys and they're getting older and they're 50 years old and fat and white like me, because it's predominantly fat and white men, and they start getting up 15 times a night, God, I've got to go for a pee in their top squeeze. Not that I suffer from this, and I really don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, that could break a marriage, yeah? I mean, seriously, it goes on. And, and there's no clinical medicine that is very effective at treating this. It's not prostate cancer. That's not even a precondition to this. This is, you know, prostate goes from this to this, yeah, and it's like really cuts off all the plumbing nightmare. Um, but this, this thing really works. And um, the interesting thing is, now this is a lesson for any of you who really want to get into anthropology or ethnobotany or anything like this. It's not, they, people from all over the world, universities from every country in the world have got this stuff and they've cracked it down to the basic chemicals. 200 chemicals, test each one, none of them work. Put it back together, still doesn't work. Yeah, the only time it works is when you've got the raw ingredient. Yeah, they take this gel at this stuff and they take it to a big distillation unit and they turn it into a thick red jelly. That gets shipped off to the UK, United States and Germany, made into these pills called Prostar, which you can buy at the chemist or you get prescribed. And I went to the factory where they're collecting this up. You would have these guys after a hard 12 days work carrying 70 pounds or 120 pounds of this stuff down on their backs, down to the pro collection place. And I followed the whole thing through the process and they ripped this thing off their backs, you know, half the time with their shirt intact, covered in crap, sweat, dust, droppings, bird droppings. The whole thing goes in the machine. And I'm like, don't you want to wash that? And he's like, no, because we don't know what the active ingredient is. You see? They don't know, but they do know that it works. In 2000, it's traditionally, the trees would have been harvested sustainably. In two, year 2000, the US finally gave up trying to find the active ingredient and agreed to let it into the country, the Food and Drug Administration. When that happened, this happened. Uh, this is sustainable. Five years one side, five years the next year. Extremely dangerous. When that and this happened, people started chopping the trees down and harvest as much as they could because the value went through the roof. It just exploded. And that's what happens. And so um, that hit the market without any safety vet, without any safety net for this species. And so the other thing the Botanic Garden was doing and continues to do is to grow these trees at the nursery, produce 20, 30,000 of them and give them away to the farmers. Now their argument is, well, I can't harvest for 15 years. How am I going to feed my kids? But they can use this as shade for their eru, you see, the netum, the vine. So this can be a shade tree. The eru can grow up this tree, so they get food from the eru. They eat some, sell some, give some away. And at the same time, they've got prunus coming up in 5, 10, 15 years' time. This is what it looks like. This is just one week's harvest, yeah? 500 tons a year, 500 tons a year off this one mountain. That doesn't account for what comes out of the rest of Cameroon and everywhere else. Another thing we're going to talk about is cola. How much time have we got? Uh, we've got until we've got 20 minutes. Okay, great. Cola, cola's really cool. I, if you go to a, a house in Central Africa, um, you got to understand that a big proportion of Cameroon society is, is Muslim. Yeah, and of course they don't, they don't drink, um, um, and they drink tea, coffee, and cola nuts, yeah? Even in all, even the Christian's house, you go there, you have dinner, when you walk in the house, you're offered cola nuts. These things are strange. This 
uh, is Colocuminata from Central Africa. Its cousin, and it looks exactly the same, its cousin is Cirobroma coca, the chocolate tree from Brazil. Even the pod looks the same. The nuts look the same when they're fresh, but they're a lot bigger on the cola tree. Strange. Both trees, extremely important at every level where they occur, yeah? You, the only contact you guys have with this is Coca-Cola, because this is what John Proctor put in the Coca-Cola. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you take these nuts, they're about this big, and you crack them, and, you, and they break into five or six, sometimes seven segments, and you hand them out. Guys chew them, you've had a couple of beers, you chew them, you get out in the morning, you're feeling groggy, you chew a cola nut. Yeah, and not to mention there's a lot of cultural and religious stuff going with this. It's really bitter, it closes your mouth down, it dries you out, but it has a pretty good kick. Yeah, it's, and its my, majority is theobromine and, co and caffeine and stuff like that. Now, um, extremely important, used millions of years, well, thousands of years, yeah. It, but why, what interests me is how did a civil war vet, somebody who just come out of the civil war, um, he was hooked on morphine, um, and he came up with this, this drink, yeah, John, John Proctor, he came up with uh, Coca-Cola, yeah, and what it was, was originally, um, when these, uh, there was, uh, when these people came back from this horrific war, a lot of them were really injured and really in pain, and they stayed in pain for the rest of their lives. Well, in Italy, they produced a red wine that was heavily laced with coca, and the soldiers would, were on morphine, which is extremely destructive and extremely addictive, as you know, and they took the coca wine to come off the morphine. And then John thought, well, why not throw cola in there, yeah? But how did he know about cola? I mean, how? So traditionally, Coca-Cola, this one, this original brand, was the wine with the coca and the cola nut, yeah? Um, in the 50s, they took out the, uh, in the 20s, they took out the alcohol because, of course, you know, prohibition. In the 50s, they took out the coca, and then they took out the cola nut, but now they just use artificial, you know? But, but, and I've been to sea, I've been, so all you're drinking really is fizzy money, you know, it's like someone's making a fortune out of this. But I, 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 um, I've been to see the original plantations where they grew this nut, all through eastern Nigeria and western Cameroon. Um, for that, for Coca-Cola and other people. It was also used to lie in medicine, and it's a dye. Now, I was listening to NPR a few weeks ago. I've always pondered, you know, okay, I understand why someone from here would understand, would know about cola, um, and would know about coca leaves, because it's South American, yeah? And it's always been used as a painkiller here. But cola? You know, why? You know, how, why not, why not, some other bizarre thing. It's as alien to him as Mars, yeah? So then I was listening to NPR a few weeks ago and I heard a Portuguese village on the coast, uh, just outside Lisbon, and they were talking to these farmers and the farmers were like, yeah, yeah, we've been drinking Coca-Cola for hundreds of years. And they're like, what do you mean hundreds of years? He says, yeah, well, we've been making it. It's not like the stuff in the red can. It's not fizzy and brown. You know, well, there's a drink that our ancestors made and they made it from the cola nut because and they made it from the coca leaf. Well, think about it. They are the only, one of the only European countries that explored both South America and Africa. And those guys really did explore Africa. All the first bases around Africa, right down to Cape Town, they were all Portuguese. So they were at contact with this plant, and I think that's where it came from. Today, though, you see, we don't want to use we want our drinks fancy, yeah, and we're going back to the good old days. So Red Bull actually contains real cola from the cola nut. So, and you can go and buy colas now uh, from Trader Joe's too, and they also gone back to the real cola, yeah. So that's pretty good. And so I mean, industrial caffeine, you can get the real cola nut. <coughs> okay, this is really interesting. This plant grows everywhere on the mountain. It grows all over the place in Central Africa. It's a ginger, and it produces this really cool red fruit. It's about this big. It's the colour of this gentleman's jacket, and it's on the ground there, fives and sixes, yeah? And when you're hiking through the rainforest, you're sweating like a pig, and they're like, gosh, do you want a drink? You know, are you dry? Yeah, dry, yeah, yeah. So they pick these things, and you bite them, chew them up, and they taste exactly like a gin and tonic. 
Now, I'm not kidding you, if you put those in the fridge, you put a slice of lemon on the side, it's a gin and tonic, yeah? Seriously, I'm not joking. It quenches your thirst immediately. This is Afromonum. This is the first spice that ever came out of Africa into Europe. Grains of paradise, yeah? This plant, this pepper, as it was called, came out of Africa before anything was coming out of India. Again, the Portuguese discovered this in Central Africa and were bringing it out. What were they using it for? They called it grains of paradise. If you look at the old maps of Africa 100 years ago, it was called the western coast wasn't the west coast, it was the grain coast. Not because they grew wheat, it's because they had this. This was of major, major value. It stayed that important until pepper from India, um, which was a lot easier to get because it was grown on plantations, hit the market and it knocked this thing off the pedestal. This was used for drinks, it was used in beer, it was a pure, it was a biocide, it's a purifier. You could pull it in stuff, you could preserve food with it. You made it into a real hot, spicy grain. You can buy it now in some, you have to send off for it. But it's a real cool plant. And um, it's now becoming more important again, it's coming back. And today, Sam Adams for instance, they've gone back to their old recipes, yeah? The other thing is, people talk about English dry gin or any gin. It's not juniper that gives it that flavour. Juniper's there, but overwhelmingly it's the aframonum that gives it that flavour. And recent research has been traditional people in one area, Cameroon used it for diabetes, and traditional re and uh, recent research is starting to show that it's um, 30, it could be a drug 30% more effective than met, um, <coughs> metformin, <coughs> which is the standard frontline treatment at the start of diabetes. So it's an incredible plant. Uh, closely related, well not closely related, the previous candidate was um, um, uh, ginger, Zingibraceae, this is Marantaceae. As again, we'll go back to our hiking through the forest scenario, yeah? And me and Cassandra there, we were hiking through the forest and we're like, oh, I can't spin you. And they're like, all right, all right, you've tried the Afro Aframonum, you liked it, yeah? Try this, it's even more fun. So they pull these fruits off, then they grow around the base again. They're all monocots, yeah? You pull the fruit off, and inside these three black seeds, and they're real hard, if you bite them, they'll shatter your teeth, no problem, yeah? They'll just reduce your teeth to rubble. So, you pop them in, though, and everyone's looking at you, the guides, and this is a tradition that goes back 100 years from what I understand. The guides are looking at you, and you start sucking on this thing, and it suddenly goes, Pilp! and it turns into a ball of licorice-flavoured jelly, yeah? And it's excruciatingly sweet. By the time you've done that and looked like this and you've spat it out, you know, which of course is good because then another plant grows up for the next future generation of hikers, um, it's too late, yeah? And what happens is this thing has a mimic sugar, yeah? And it's 2,000 times sweeter than sugar. It's not a sugar, it's a protein, so you have no issues with calories. It doesn't actually, it's not sweet, it just tricks your taste buds into thinking it is. And it gives your tongue a great coating, yeah? So from the rest of the day, and sometimes the next day, whatever you eat and drink tastes really badly sweet, you know? Nauseatingly sweet. And um, this plant, we've got this at the conservatory, this plant was the first plant that was the, was the plant that was the first uh, subject of international property rights. See, Tate and Lyle, the British Sugar Company in the 50s, found this. They knew about this plant. They took, grabbed it. They went on Mount Cameron, did the usual thing. You know, we'll drive up Mount Cameron, throw, give the chief, you know, a crate of beer and a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, get his permission to take as many of these plants as you can because they grow like weeds. Yeah, dig them all up, stick them in bags, send them to Ghana up the road, plant them out. What's the problem? Then you can start reproducing, mass producing this as an artificial sweetener and make millions a year. Yeah, that kind of upset the government of Cameroon, yeah, and rightly so, yeah, and there was no permission, no permit, no nothing. So that became a subject of international property rights, which is, you know, the Convention on Biodiversity that's all around this thing. That's a different story. But the interesting thing is that um, what's happening now is they're, they're actually uh, trying to sequence the genes and they're taking the sweet genes and they're putting them into things that need sugar, but having no sugar. So there's chocolate that's extremely bitter, but very flavoursome. 
so they could put the genes into that. This is the idea, put the genes into that plant. It's not as simple as this. Produce uh, a sweet, very flavoursome, calorie-free chocolate. Can you imagine how much that's worth here? Billions, yeah? And then, of course, you make this uh, thematitine. The name of this plant is Thematococcus denelii, and you can make this thematitine, which is the pure compound. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is I read a, an account of, Fair, anyone familiar with Fairchild Botanic Garden down in Miami? Very, very famous garden. You must go and see it. It's a wonderful garden. They focused on, it's, it's very old, and they focused on palms and cycads, but it's a wonderful garden. And it was owned by um, Colonel Montgomery and David Fairchild. And these two gentlemen were very rich. And they spent their entire lives exploring the world, their adult lives, looking for plants. Yeah? And they went to Limbo in 1920. Can you imagine? And I saw a picture of them. And I read their account. And they said, forest, fantastic. Garden, amazing. Yeah? People, wonderful. But the beer is so sweet. And I was like, I know why, because you guys, because what happens there is you go out and hike in the forest with your, range, with your rangers or your guides, you come back and tradition dictates, you buy them a meal and some beers, yeah? And of course, these guys would have fallen for this trick. And they kept complaining endlessly about how sweet the beer was. <laughs> very strange. Okay, one more plant, Ancestor Cladus uh, Carapensis. Uh, are you, anyone familiar with the Corrup National Park? Uh, you should be. It's right on the border, yeah? Wonderful national park. No one goes there because there's no way of getting to it. I mean, this day, some madman sat down one day and said, with a map of West Africa, like here, and he said, oh, we're going to make that a national park. And he did, yeah? Fair enough. You know, we all want national parks. But there's no way of getting to it, yeah? <laughs> really hard to get to. But I managed to get there. And about 20 years ago, they discovered this really strange plant. This plant climbs, yeah? And it has these ancestral cladus is a Latin way of saying you've got curly fingers, yeah? And this plant has these incredible curly tendrils that curl around. And they're very strange. They're not like anything you've ever seen. They really are. It's like a witch's finger. They're all kind of twisted and stiff and sharp. And they hook on and stuff and they grow. Well, um, someone discovered these. They, a, a gentleman, an English guy actually, uh, I'm not going to say his name, he works at, he did work at Missouri and he, he was basically an African expert and he, uh, Missouri Botanic Garden, and he knows this forest like the back of his hand and um, he was instrumental in making this national park and he systematically went through and sampled all the plants with the people who live there, Mondemba people. And they said, oh no, no, this plant's the only plant we don't use. We do not touch this thing. We don't burn it. We don't go near it. We don't touch it. It's super poisonous. So, of course, this guy was like, wow, light goes on, you know. If it's poisonous, it must be useful. So he bags, so he does the worst thing you could ever do. And none of you ever do this because your careers will be decimated, yeah. He packs up a backpack full of leaves, hops on a plane and brings them straight into the U.S., yeah. No permits, no documents. Missouri went mad, totally disowned him. Uh, he got himself fired and he handed it to a pharmaceutical company. And they tested it and they were like, wow, it's composed of all these different compounds, but these two are really interesting. And this one kills HIV viruses in the in the vitro, yeah? Problem is, it kills a patient before it kills the virus, because it's so toxic, yeah? But what they did discover, now this is becoming a whole new series of anti-malarial drugs. So, it, you know, these things are out there. These plants are out there. You don't have to steal leaves and jump on a plane to find these things. You can do it the right way, but these things are still out there. And that park, this plant only occurs on the edge of that park, nowhere else, this species. There are three species in all. Um, Stavanthus hispida, you would have seen this at the conservatory. Um, I saw this being used by the Bantu people down in, on the edge of Gabon and Equatorial Guinea. These guys, they really do, yep, they really make blowpipes and crossbows and they really kill animals with it, sometimes each other. They're very fearsome people. Um, bit bad, I mean, these guys are quite small but well built. This thing grows at the top of the highest trees, yeah? <laughs> so these guys climb up with a makeshift vine climbing gear, harvest the seed pods, bring them down, dry them, make them into stravanthine. Um, 
and it's an extremely poisonous uh, substance. It's similar to, its, it's analogue would be like the conodendron tomatose and the curare of South America. These guys are the one you never hear about this. Um, uh, but what, what happened was research has shown, and it was, research was done in the 20s and 30s, and they came up with this drug, Orbane, and they actually use the opposite to what it causes in the victim. In the victim, it causes heart failure, and there's a compound they've taken from it which is used to treat cardiac failure, which is really interesting. And this, I don't know, I, I assume this is still being used. Um, this plant, Rewolfia vomitoria, everyone knows about Rewolfias and, and um, what's, uh, what are those things called? Um, but, but psychotries, psychotries. Psychotries and Rewolfia are very similar and um, they, they grow everywhere in Cameroon and people used to use it as a tea for treat like craziness, yeah, madness. Um, and of course, everyone dismissed that. But then in 1952, this guy started looking at it and there was no treatment for uh, schizophrenia. But he did some tests and he found that it would treat high percent, um, blood pressure, <coughs> high blood pressure. And then he also found that his patients that were uh, suffering from schizophrenia showed a, a marked improvement. And this, this, so this plant, this plant was developed into the respiring. You can now, they, they now get this, they don't get this from uh, Rewolfia vomitura anymore because it's hard to clean the, the product up. It's still quite toxic. They now will get it from a psychotria from India, which is a shame. And this guy, um, a few years ago, during my stay, I suddenly, these grows all along the roadside. It's a really pretty tree. Beautiful flower, yeah, grows all along the roadsides. It's a strange looking nut, it's about the size of this. And suddenly everybody was collecting this. Suddenly it became really valuable. And uh, basically what happened was that they, we, they, they've always used it for a whole cocktail of things, headaches, sinus, madness, um, and um, lactation. They use a lot of things for inducing lactation in women. Um, and, um, but what happened was it was discovered that this, this had orbril and you know, migraines has become the, the problem, of our, uh, one of our key problems. And this stuff really works and the way it works is to improve the blood flow, flow through the brain. And so they put out a call. Now this is a major crop. People make a lot of money. This used to be fairly worthless to most people. In fact, it's quite poisonous. It could kill your wild stock, it could kill your goats. You didn't want the kids playing with it. And apart from a few, you know, these, these, really, these medical uses, it had not much use. Now, of course, you could barely find it because everyone's picking it and it's, and what it done, what it did was to raise the economy in these areas. Um, you want to go on to the last one? Um, yeah, we're, we're just at the end of the Okay, okay. I want to just tell you this. Uh, this is the one that you need to start looking up online, yeah? If you can write that down, Tabernacle Boga, I promise you a thrilling and ex uh, exciting story. This is, stands on the line between sinister and mystical and all the information nobody wants you to know about this plant. And I'll let you look this up, but um, it is truly amazing, yeah? Um, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful drug. It's made from the roots of this plant. I had this growing all around my yard in Cameroon, everywhere. I, and, and people were planting it. It's the, it's the source of a very ancient religion called the Buidi religion, and, which is predominantly from Gabon. And you take this material, um, it's taken as a, uh, uh, they scrape the box and it looks like dried tobacco and then someone will be, if they're going to be induced, people take small amounts all the time and it gives a clarity of thought and endurance. But these guys, when they dress up like this and they go to what they call the church and they take this stuff, they take it by the handful and they go into a really bizarre trance um, and 
the first, it's a two-phase thing. First thing is you're super hypoactive, all vomiting, super hypoactive. It's pretty unpleasant. That lasts for a few hours, and then suddenly these people snap out of that and they go into this deep, deep, deep trance that lasts for days. And it's reckoned to be the only thing that our scientists can figure out is that all they've done with all these tests is to find that their brains go into a rapid form of REM. Yeah. So instead of 20 minutes of REM a night when people are sleeping, this can go on for days. That cleans the brain up. But what these guys tell you is when they're in that state, they go back through time. They go back to before they were born. They remember everything they did in their lives. They go back and back and they talk to their ancestors. These guys are doing this because there's an issue in their family or there's a problem and they want to resolve that problem. They only do it then. And then when they start coming out of this thing, they can remake decisions. Now, if we've got time, this gentleman, yeah, he died last year or a year before. And he, he was an American guy. He's messing around with drugs all his life. Somehow, somehow, he, and look at these, they look like little brains, these are the seeds. Somehow he acquired some abogaine and he took that with some of his friends. They're all hooked on marijuana, they're all hooked on um, uh, opiates, yeah? Four out of five of them were clean, completely cleaned up over a weekend. Now no one believes this, yeah? Until you start reading about it, yeah? And there's a lot of dark side to our legal system, our pharmaceutical system that, that put this to death. But the, it's uh, almost instantaneous cure for all of these. And it really, really works. Not for everyone, but it does work for the majority of the patients. There are lots of clinics all around the Switzerland, all around the Caribbean, who offer extremely expensive treatments using this product um, to our rich, you know, spoiled kids who, or whatever, you know, kids, parents who, their kids have got hit on something and they're hooked on something and they send them over there, place no one ever talks about, and they come out cleaned up. That's it. So. And this is the Botanic Garden.